John, this is Real Talk, where we talk with real leaders about real leadership situations. And so I'm very grateful that you took some time to talk to me today. John Hester is with the Blatchard Companies, a longtime leadership development expert. Prior to Blanchard, you were a director of leadership development at Nike. You and I have been friends for eight or nine years, I think. Oh, wow. All right. Yep. Time goes by fast. So anyway, the I think what we're going to focus on, John, today is we can talk about whatever you want, share your wisdom with us. But we, I know that you've been working recently with Blanchard on a new set of solutions for leaders leading virtually, right? And seems like a month and a half ago, the big thing was, or two months ago, the big concern was, how are we going to manage through COVID? And today, the big concern is, how are we going to reopen our work situation? And some things will never go back to the way they were before, right? So I know you guys and you and your, your team has done a lot with regard to figuring out best practices and uh, methods for leading and learning virtually. So I'm really interested in talking to you about that. And just in the little bit of experience I've had with Blanchard, I'm very interested in you just sharing with us what that organization is like. I mean, I truly have been impressed with just the communication, the way you guys operate, who Ken Blanchard is, the founder of your organization. So yeah, I'm going to shut up and let you talk. Start, why don't you start with just tell us a little bit about you and how you got to where you are. Oh, wow. Um, so I, I started my career many years ago in technology training. So I was a software trainer and started my own. I worked for Northrop Aerospace out of college doing computer training and then started my own computer training company. And then the recession hit and I went to work for Unisys uh, managing their computer training group. And I noticed that a lot of the leaders at our facility were not getting any training in any kind of management or leadership skills. And so we uh, went to corporate and said, what do you got? And they said, well, you, even though it was an internal training, we couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. So it was going to be too costly. And so I asked the, the program manager, you know, I've got a, a team of people that have some experience here. Could we develop something? And I ended up developing and delivering it. And as much as I liked computer training, the leadership stuff was just more, more impactful, more meaningful, and really kind of fell in love with that. So I started to put together some things and, and got into it that way. And then uh, this position came open at Nike to be the director of learning and development for their ops and technology organization. So it was a perfect fit, uh, kind of a perfect storm. And when I got to Nike, they didn't have much in the way of leadership development outside of a couple kind of Nike specific kind of programs. So when I went to HR and said, you mind if I start bringing stuff in? They said, great. And I started bringing in stuff from Franklin Covey and Blanchard and others and getting myself and my team qualified in those programs. And then uh, over the course of the next couple of years, we got other departments wanting to take training from our organization. And we became, in essence, the, we were the Nike Professional Development Center and offering all kinds of leadership programs and professional development programs. And, um, after six years, I decided to go out and hang my consulting shingle up and Blanchard immediately came to me and said, would you like to come work for us? And I said, absolutely. So it's kind of what got me here. Yeah, I think I've heard the story that, that uh, Ken Blanchard actually took you golfing or something like that and offered you the job on the, you want to make sure that you could actually golf first or what was that all about? No, that was actually... Um, in hindsight, I realized that Ken was subtly recruiting me. So <laughs> I had presented a few years before I left. I was, I was asked to present at the Blanchard Client Conference. So every two years, Blanchard has clients come in and present about what they're doing with the Blanchard products and things. And uh, Ken came to my session that I was doing there and then asked me to stay the next day and go golfing with him. And then the next time I was down there for a certification about two years later, he asked me to go to a baseball game with him. And I ended up in the president's box at Padre Stadium with him and the board of directors, um, pretty much. <laughs> so it's like, okay, maybe he was recruiting me subtly, but you know. Yeah, so not, and, you, and that, was, that was 12 years ago or something like that? So I, I left Nike and started with Blanchard in 2006. 
Okay. And for those that aren't real familiar with who Ken Blanchard is, you want to just give us a rundown of what makes him so special? Who is he and why is he so special? So most people know Ken from the One Man Manager series of books, right? So the first One Man Manager came out in like 1982. But what, what makes Ken so special, and I, I think this is true of Stephen Covey, even though I didn't know Stephen as well as I, I know Ken, is who they appear to be is exactly who they are. That he is just the most wonderful, kind, loving um, leader that you could ever want. But what's also great is his wife, Margie, is just as amazing in a different way. And they started the company together, and she's been intimately involved with the company ever since its, its outset. She served as president and uh, led our Office of the Future, looking at research and those kinds of things. And so they formed the company with uh, six other co-founders back in 1979. and even in their early 80s, they're still involved in the company and love this work. So. so the whole concept of situational leadership, Hershey, uh, Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard developed that model together. Today, Blanchard calls that SL2, which I think is the greatest tool. I mean, it should be in everybody's tool, every leader's toolbox. Um, and I know at Learning Point, we, we don't really partner with other content providers. We don't use anyone else's material except for uh, Blanchard's material. And so I'm loosely associated with Blanchard in that way. And it's been kind of interesting because in the past three months, um, I receive at least two emails a day from the Blanchard organization as though I was part of the Blanchard family, right? And one of them, every morning, Ken Blanchard sends an email out, which I assume it's going to all of the employees, which I'm not an employee, but I'm on the list, right? Maybe all the employees and the, uh, uh, the uh, consulting partners. Um, and just the type of communication that's been going on within the Blanchard family over the past three months, uh, has been very impressive. It's proof of what you're talking about, that they're legit to what they're doing, which I think is pretty cool. So, and uh, John, you have traveled the world with them, right? You've gone yeah. everywhere teaching leaders. So maybe share with us a few things that if you could summarize in the top three, I don't know, I'm putting you on the spot here because I know we didn't rehearse this question, but what would you say are some of the biggest observations or or key insights that you have regarding leadership, whether it's in Southern California, Kansas City, or India, or anywhere else? What, what have you found? What are some of the biggest challenges or insights when it comes to leadership? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> um, let, me, let me start by just going back to your comment about SL2, um, because I do think that is, that is our greatest contribution to the leadership world. Um, the other stuff we have is fantastic. We have workshops on building trust, on leading in virtual teams, on coaching and all kinds of other products, but that the SL2 model is what is unique. And there's nothing, I've seen other organizations try to replicate it in some way, and there's just nothing like it as far as just a, a, a tool, a language to be able to coach and develop your people. So when it comes to that role of a leader to coach and develop your team, there's nothing I've seen that, that really is as practical, usable, and has that, that balance between um, you know, performance and engagement, right? How do you get that balance um, when you're leading people one-to-one? -one? So that, that's one thing, right? So, so that piece of it. Um, so that's more the, the operational side of leadership. Then there's the strategic side of leadership, which is the vision, direction, the culture creation, and all those kinds of stuff. And, you know, culture is huge. So mm -hmm. the culture you create as an organization is what really defines you. It's, um, and, and that's where organizations really shine. Um, Nike had a very, very, has a very, very strong culture. And that culture is in a great, a large way responsible for its success 
Mm -hmm. um, Blanchard's culture has a lot to do with its success. The, the culture of, you know, people come to the company wanting to make a difference, wanting to serve, wanting to help other companies and leaders around the globe. So I think that's a big piece of it, right? What kind of culture do you create in your organization? What's it centered around? What's its central purpose? I love that. Um, I'll go pre-COVID because we're seeing some shifts out there in the world where you got, you know, some of the major CEOs in the world talking about the quadruple bottom line. So getting past just the profitability shareholder kind of stuff and thinking about the difference they make in the world and the community and having a, a greater purpose than just making money. And mm -hmm. that's where I think you create an organization that attracts the best and the brightest and gets the greatest innovation and creativity. Um, and then with COVID, what's been interesting is to see that the companies that are really, I don't know, you know, there's so many, this is a, a tough one because there are so many things that are outside of your control, right? Um, but the level of transparency that I'm seeing in many organizations is huge. So you talked about, you know, the emails that come out from Ken every morning. So Ken's been doing that for as long as I've been with Blanchard. Mm -hmm. um, and the few times that he doesn't do it, he gets others to kind of take his place. So he asks for volunteers to send out a morning message, but it's every morning you get this message from Ken that's, you know, inspiring. But his son, Scott, took over the reins of the company back in January just just before all this hit mm -hmm. and the level of th that word transparency vulnerability openness and honesty about where we're at as a company what we might have to do what can we do in the meantime to kind of make you know things work uh just has been amazing to me and that's what i'm seeing in the best companies right now is that same kind of leadership so that you know the more strategic side you've got that kind of leader that's out there, you know, setting the example. That's excellent. I think of SL2, the model, which in my, just my translation of what that, that tool does, it helps a leader determine the, the appropriate match or style, the, how they should approach a situation based on the need of the person that they're leading, right? their development level and the task that that person needs to accomplish um and i i suppose the tool is you talked about purpose in an organization a culture in an organization you know the quadruple bottom line i guess that could translate down to the individual leader too is that um i i suppose the tool would be helpful to help you get work done it, it help you get production done but the bigger value is as as a leader is if you're using that tool to increase the capacity of the person that you're helping to support to get the work done does that make sense would you agree with that yeah um one of my favorite of ken's books so if, if you haven't if, if the people listening to this have not read any of ken's books um he's got about 80 of them out there and they're all story based and the one that is one of my favorites is helping people win at work. And then the subtitle is, don't mark my paper, help me get an A. And he tells a story often okay. about being a college professor and he would, at the very beginning of the semester, give out the final exam. And then he'd teach to that through the rest of the term. And his, he thought, well, my job is to educate and to help them to get an A. And that's a leader's job. And so if you're a, a supervisor, frontline manager, your job is to help your team get an A. And it's the kind of the fundamental essence of being a servant leader is I'm here to serve you and help you to get your job done. Now, because of that, I'll look good because, you know, yeah. I'm going to be successful, but that's my whole purpose of a leader is, and then if you don't want to do that, why'd you take that job as a manager? <laughs> that's good. Don't mark my paper. Don't grade my paper. Help me get an A. That's good. I needed more professors like that when I was going through school, I think. But, um, it's funny, I, I actually had that same approach without even knowing uh, that I had not read his book at the time, but when I was teaching, that was my philosophy as well. And so you either 
you know, if you put the effort in, you got an A, but if you didn't, you're, you're probably going to fail or best get a C. But I gave you all the opportunities to, to learn and get what you needed out of the content. And uh, yeah, made sense. That's to me. good. 80 books, true, uh, obviously a very well-known thought leader in leadership, the one minute manager, uh, you know, the model SL2 situation leadership, the one minute manager was the, the big one. Um, but, and there were a lot of books that were written with that title. So one of, one of the ones that gets talked about most from participants and workshops is the one minute manager meets the monkey, oh. which uses the metaphor of a monkey being the, the problem that's on your back. Yeah. And too many managers want to keep the problem instead of, or take the problem even away and put it on your back instead of, helping people to figure out the problem and solve it for themselves uh, kind of thing. But so he had a whole series of them that were about that. He's also, the other thing about him as an author that's unique is he co-authors everything. So every single book. <laughs> so one of my favorites is a book he co-authored with Don Shula, you know, the legendary oh. dolphins coach yeah. around coaching. Um, he's written books oh. with the CEO of, so the, Helping people when at work was with Gary Ridge, who's the CEO of WD40, mm -hmm. who had gone through. We also sponsor a master's program at the University of San Diego in executive leadership. And he had gone through that program and started implementing a lot of the stuff that we teach in there and started to see an amazing transformation with WD40. And so mm -hmm. they ended up co authoring this book. So it's interesting how he does that. That's cool. Let's shift gears. I want to go back to Nike for a minute because you said something that that uh, that struck a chord with me. Very strong culture, right? It's part of who they are and the culture that they have. We've all experienced it, right? So the, the culture is the experience that all of us have, not just the employees that work there, but even us as customers and that type of thing. And we have done a little bit of work with Nike enough to know that their their leadership development the way they approach leadership training and development i don't think anyone would characterize it as centralized right the the leadership the actual culture and the leadership might be but the way they actually what they provide the tools and the training isn't necessarily centralized very decentralized at times right so I don't know if you have any insights on that, but the obviously we're in the we're in the business of leadership development, so it we obviously believe that it does some good. But at the end of the day, that alone is not the trick. I take it right. The leadership isn't necessarily in the workshop. The leadership is maybe helped by the workshop. But how would you? What do you have to say about that? So. The where Nike puts its energy around training is in the culture pieces. So there is a very strong leadership development culture ar um, around the culture itself. So um, the orientation you get to the culture, the immersion you get, um, the way they just everything about the campus and, and communication is all about the culture. And one of the things that I think is an interesting story about Nike is when I got there was kind of the first time the company had been a little bit flat in their growth and uh, profit margins, et cetera. And a lot of that was because they had achieved their mission. Their mission was to become the number one sports and fitness company in the world. And they were always competing against Adidas and all these other you know, outside entities. And once they achieved that, you started to see the competition going to competing within instead of competing without. And they lost their vision of where they wanted to go. So they did something that you know most organizations don't do is they went out to all the employees worldwide and different functions and said, you know, what do we want this company to be about going forward? And they developed this new mission of being um, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And then they have an asterisk under the word athlete athlete saying if you have a body you're an athlete and from that point forward everything about the company became about inspiring and innovating all their marketing went away from product because it used to be all product focused went to inspire people to get out and move yeah. and do things and that's where they invest their core 
right? And that kind of bringing that together. So then I, and hopefully nobody um, from Nike listens to this, um, they're dysfunctional when it comes to traditional leadership development, where they will centralize and then six years later, they'll blow it up completely and decentralize, get rid of all those people and decentralize, then they'll centralize them and they've gone through this cycle. And so the culture trumps, I think, everything else because of that. So mm -hmm. I had, uh, when I was there in the, so like I said, we were um, about 1800 employees worldwide in my organization that I was totally responsible for uh, leadership development. But then we were kind of adjunct to the rest of the company providing all these other trainings. And we really immersed the culture in SL2. And uh, it was really embedded into new employee orientation, manager orientation. It was embedded into the performance management process. It was just part of the DNA of parts of the organization. But leadership above me changed and wanted to go in a different direction. And um, I saw the writing on the wall, which is why I decided to leave. And you know, six years later, you could hardly find somebody who you know, knows SL2, um, which is sad. Because it yeah. really, you talk to the people that were there during that time, they felt it made an impact and the training that we're doing made an impact. But then another leader didn't feel like it was that important and they went a different direction and they blew up that organization. And uh, you know, I don't know what's happened recently over there, but yeah, I think the, the emphasis on the culture is kind of overseeing maybe some bad practices. Yeah, I think a lot of the leaders there have a great experience there too but they don't all they grow and move on they go other places right yeah um so let's talk for a little bit about the work that you've been doing and leading in a virtual world um pre-covid even back i know for maybe the last four or five years you've been doing some training some leadership sessions virtually I, I sat through one that was at least four years ago and it opened my eyes to what was possible, right? And at Learning Point, we've been doing more, obviously, <laughs> lately for sure. But in my sense, Blanchard is, is paving the way, setting the, the, uh, the course for a lot of good virtual learning. It's not just training, it's learning experiences where the the end goal is that it still changes a person's capacity in their job, right? They can make the change and using virtual type resources to make that happen. That's the learning side of it. But really the work you've been doing is on leading virtually, not just learning virtually. And so we, we were used to certain things back before COVID, you know, six months ago, we were all in a certain pattern. Hopefully someday in the future, we'll come back to something different than what we're in now. But that doesn't mean we're going back to the old way, right? I mean, in the, so much has changed and we've, we've innovated. And I know that you've been involved in that kind of work. So what are the top things that come to mind if, if, if a manager now is going to be leading people that are working remotely? Uh, what, are the, what, what, what insights do you have for us on that? And this, this became a passion of mine, um, partly because I was a remote employee, right? And so I was working virtually, either full-time from home or on the road, right? And I was also leading a team that was virtual. And so when I did my doctoral work, that was the focus of my, my research, was around leading virtually, working virtually. And then when I saw the opportunity to get involved in virtual training, you know, those two things kind of came together and that I, I developed a passion for training virtually as much as I love the the face to face connection that you get when you're in the physical classroom. You can do so much with the tools and technology today and mm -hmm. good design and content and good facilitation. Um, I think it's about 80% of what you could do in the face to face classroom. Um, so then I was doing a lot of virtual training, doing a lot of designing of virtual courses. And I had designed a course for one of our clients on leading in a virtual team. And it was hugely popular, this client. They've made it something that they rolled out all over the world. We've got eight faculty at Blanchard who deliver this training uh, virtually all over the world. 
but it's also a training program that um, is not just you go to these sessions and you're done. It's we, we create, it's, it's called leading in a virtual team. You create a virtual team out of your learning cohort before you even have your first session. Okay. And then we have six uh, sessions that are targeted towards specific habits of leading in a virtual team. And we use Microsoft Teams as a way to form the team, engage with the team, or we're using Adobe Connect to deliver the training. Teams is the kind of the catch all for how we're working together. Mm -hmm. we, and then over the next four weeks, we're working together uh, virtually without actually having any meetings all through Microsoft Teams. So they go out and they experiment with what they learn. They post what they've learned from that experience, what their challenges were. We have some dialogue together through Microsoft Teams and they go each week. They're focused on one of those habits. And um, so there, there's a couple things there. There's you know, just the, the power of learning over time, right? The learning should not be an event. It should not be a workshop. So we at Blanchard have really embraced this whole idea of learning journeys. And we've been doing them for a long time, but we're, we're going all in now on creating mm -hmm. learning journeys with our clients and blended learning journeys. So part of it will be e-learning, which you know the e-learning today that we're developing is nothing like you would have seen even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very engaging. Um, so it combines e-learning, uh, action assignments that you do, uh, discussion groups that you have, and then, you know, that could go on for six months to even a year. We're developing some of these learning journeys. So we've gone not only all into that, but all into digital as well. Um, so we're doing all of our training is available in a virtual face, a virtual live classroom instructor led but we also have you know getting most of our products into digital content in a number of different formats as well so so that's the learning piece right of you know learning virtually etc when you think about leading virtually um what we learn to do in a face-to-face -face environment doesn't work the same in a virtual environment a lot of the stuff that would happen naturally in a face-to-face -face doesn't happen naturally so I think if I could say one thing, a lot of leaders got away with bad leadership <laughs> in a face-to-face -face environment, and you can't get away with that in the virtual environment. So for example, you could lead a, you could run a poorly led meeting in a face-to-face -face environment, but because they're there, you can engage them and know that they're not engaged and stuff like that. But you don't get that in a virtual environment. So you've got to be much more structured and disciplined about what you do. You got to be much more proactive, like building trust doesn't happen naturally in a virtual environment. So you've got to go out of your way to make sure that every instant message you send, every email you send, every meeting you lead, you show up fully present and engaged and you, you think through before you, you think about the purpose before you send any instant message or email. So. That's good. You've reminded me. I, I, uh... I made the mistake recently of clipping my fingernails during a team meeting, <laughs> thinking that no one would notice. And one of my favorite team members of our team said, Mark, are you clipping your fingernails? <laughs> so I don't know why I thought I probably should have brought that up, but there's little things that you might think are hidden. Um, that maybe aren't is hidden, right? So yeah, how you show up, you've got to you've got to keep that in mind. How do I want people to see me? You know, do I want them to see me as caring, compassionate, present, etc.? You know, well, I better show up that way every time I'm on camera or on a call. Yeah. So, and what do you have to say about leading leading virtually when people are remote? Every a lot of people are doing that right now, and maybe we're coming out of it, but. There, the world is going to be different. I think hopefully the remote, the technology and the remote work will stick and we'll find very productive ways of utilizing that. When it comes to making contact with your team members, um, I mean, we've got this practice that we teach called daily contact as a leader, as a manager. Uh, make daily contact, which is kind of consistent with Blanchard's one-minute manager principle, right? Yep. 
make contact with them daily, short, brief, in, you know, exchange. So you're checking in, you're setting the tone. Does that become more important or less possible from your, in your opinion, from your vantage point? How, how, how can you apply that principle well when you're leading remotely, leading virtually? Let, let me back into that with a couple of things. Um, what's been really interesting about this COVID situation is there are a lot of practices that we've been kind of teaching and preaching for a while that weren't happening to the depth of what we'd want to see. Well, COVID has kind of forced people's hands and we're seeing very positive things happening that we've been encouraging well before this. Things like being on camera, right? So if you're, you, if you're gonna build community, you've gotta be on camera. You gotta pe see people's body language, see their facial expressions. Um, it's not enough just to be on the phone. Yeah. It's also going to ensure engagement. You've got to um, foster community in a proactive way because it's not happening if you're not doing that. So people um, tend to feel isolated and, and out of sight, out of mind when they're working virtually. And so things like, you know, seeing virtual coffee hours and happy hours and other things that you've never seen to this level are happening today. So I've, I've talked to people who feel more connected to their team now that they're working virtually than they ever felt face to face because of, of that reaching out and doing that. So that's got to continue. We've got to continue to actively foster community because it, it's so easy to lose that in the virtual space. So that, that's number one. Um, and so what you said is that everything that you should be doing in the face-to-face -face environment becomes much more critical to do in the virtual environment. Now, I wanna put a, a little pin there of you gotta be careful micromanaging. So mm -hmm. one of the things most managers struggle with when they start to lead virtually is how do I know you're working? Mm -hmm. And so managers have to get away from worrying about your day-to-day -day activity and focusing more on what do you what do you want them to produce? Right. The results. And then yeah. Having trans transparent scoreboards for the whole team that everything that everybody's working on is right there in front of the whole team and people are keeping it updated with green, yellow, red, whatever they use, kind of thing, right? And let that guide people's behavior instead of you checking in. So you, or there's a difference between checking in and checking up. Right. And too many virtual managers make the mistake of checking up on their people instead of just checking in and saying, how are you doing today? Mm -hmm. Right. How are your kids? Right. How is it working for you having your kids home right now while you're trying to get work done? Right. Those kinds of things. Yeah, that's good. I, uh, <clears throat> I remember watching the NFL draft just because I'm curious and, you know, um, which was all remote this year, yeah. right? And it was interesting to watch these coaches and general managers of these, of these, of the football teams in their, in their home environment. Most of them were <laughs> in their home office or whatever. And some of them were just perfectly comfortable with kids and grandkids, you know, walking behind them and their dog was up on their lap and it was a different environment than anything we had seen before. And so some of that, I think that there's this element of, you know, personability, if that's a word that hopefully will stick with us too, right? That certain things are okay. Obviously family members and dogs and pets can't get in the way of work, but it does allow us to be hopefully more of ourself if we're, i guess there's some downsides too as to where if you're at home you're never completely at home if you're working and and that type of thing but uh i don't know you have anything to say about that element yeah i i think what i've been really talking about is um a new definition of what it means professionalism means in the home workplace because before it was probably just you home mm -hmm. and your kids were at school and your spouse was at work or, or something like that. Now everybody's home and you've got this kid you're homeschooling, you know, <laughs> wait, who doesn't want to be homeschooled, mind you. And you've got three of them and a spouse that's on a call and you're on a call and 
I think we need to just give people grace yeah. and, and be okay with people showing up a little bit different than the old expectation of, you know, put the shirt on, put the, you know, groom yourself, be ready and, and make sure the door is closed. And yeah, yeah, you want to set boundaries for your family, but when the child comes in and you just put them on your lap and you introduce them and they, they get that time and they go away again and, and it becomes much more real. I think we need to be more real. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I, I'm, I'm intrigued. All these different Zoom meetings and different types of meetings that I've been doing with lots of different, you know, lots of different purposes and different people, it is intriguing to see what's behind them. You know, what, what's going on? <laughs> I know yeah. you're about to move, so your desk has never been as clean as it is right now. Right? I know, yes. It's kind of a little embarrassing that there's just that one little statuette that's back there and nothing else, that and Kleenex. It's like a story though, you know, tell us the story. Um, exactly. Well, yeah. and I, I, I know backgrounds are a big deal and stuff, and I just prefer seeing people's environment. Yeah. Uh, I was on a call with a client who, um, I, I won't name the client, but they, this person, I, I really enjoy working with them, but they're very professional, very um, straight laced. And I asked them to come on camera and she was sitting on the couch, reclined with a blanket around her and with her laptop out. And it was, I love the fact that she could feel comfortable doing that with me, you know? Yeah, that's great. So um, let's go back to the learning side then, because you said something that struck a chord with me on the, on the uh, you know, checking up versus checking in. When it comes to learning and the old e-learning, I remember, having clients that tried to measure whether or not the extent to what to which a learner was actually completing a given e-learning module right could we measure where they're at can we track did they watch the full video did they get all the way through the module and that type of thing and trying to help them realize that well maybe that's not what you want to measure why don't you measure let's create outcomes of the learning and measure that what did they do differently on the job and I remember saying, you know what, maybe what, we're, what we need to build are not e-learning, an e-learning system, but build an online system that, that it promotes on-the-job learning and change. So how have you, you know, what is Blanchard doing with regard to that? Is that part of what you try to do? With, you, you talked about the learning journeys that you're creating. Talk more about that because it's probably in, in that design. Yes. Um... I would say the first thing I would say is that e-learning by itself does not work for 95% of the population. That it is too self-driven and and most employees are too busy mm -hmm. to make time for it unless it's mandated. And even then they don't pay attention to what they're learning. And so it's just not a good platform in and of itself. It's good for being part of an experience. And that, so we design it where, um, and we have, we have the ability for clients to just purchase the year learning and do nothing else, but that's not what we suggest by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so for example, I'm developing one with this one client, um, a very large, huge software manufacturer um, and hardware manufacturer, I guess, but um, giant in their industry where recognize the name and you said it probably right yeah probably yeah okay. um the uh, they came to us and said okay this face-to-face -face classroom thing that we were doing we need to convert it into a virtual environment and we want it to be able to mirror the face-to-face -face as close as possible and we say you know if you're going to do that let's go ahead and expand it into a learning journey and so it, it's a four-week learning journey and they had that exact question of how do we know that they've done it right so what we designed was four one-hour virtual sessions spread over four weeks. Mm -hmm. And then there is work to do in between where they watch videos, they, they go into, and it's all designed to be self-directed um, communication. So the facilitator, there's no moderator or anything, but you give them assignments like at the end of goal setting piece, they have to go and write three SMART goals and then they have to go review three smart goals of somebody else 
and make comments and help them make them more smart. And you know, so they're doing real work, real work on their real stuff over these four weeks. But what we decided to do as saying complete is you not only had to attend the four sessions and do all the work in between, is you have to then apply what you've learning and then you have to post a video where you talk about what you've been doing and your lessons learned and that video is the mark of completion. Mm -hmm. So what have you been doing? What have you learned from that? What are the challenges you've been experiencing? How have you applied this in the real world? That becomes the, the check that they went through the training. Which I, that's awesome. And making a video of yourself, right? Creating that video four years ago, five years ago, that would have been a major <laughs> hurdle for most of us, right? But today, it's almost commonplace. We, obviously, we can do it on our iPhone. We can do it uh, on our computer. It, it's much easier to do and, and makes that accountability, that reporting so much more useful and effective. It's, yeah. That's a great use of technology. I love that. So, um, so talk to us just a little bit. We just got a few more minutes. But given the different clients that you've worked with, uh, and I know you've worked with a, a, a wide variety, some of them, a lot of them, are major global brands that we would recognize, um, and then others that are not necessarily uh, as recognizable. Um, what would you say are some of the things that have impressed you the most about the organizations that seem to be getting it right when it comes to leadership development? Is that a fair question? Can you... What are some of the things you've noticed recently in the past three or four years where organizations are getting it right? What are they doing? Well, it, if, if you think about, you know, if I were to just say to an organization, here are the things you need to do to really create behavior change, to create the culture you're looking for. Um, you know, as hard as it is in this industry, it starts with metrics, right? What are the things you're trying? What are the levers you're trying to move? Are you trying to increase engagement, retention, and, and what's your bench right now and where do you want to be with that? Now let's design a training program that will create the behaviors that will lead to that. Mm -hmm. And let's measure it, right? Let's see if there's a difference. I love the, the uh, supervisory um, consulting that you do with organizations where you really, you take them through a year long experience and you have very clear, was it five measures, I think, if I remember correctly? Yeah, we're trying to put that. them in five categories, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's an important piece and letting them determine what those measures are. So that, yeah. that's a piece that is missing in almost all organizations. So one of my favorite clients is a large uh, car manufacturer, a, you know, well-known, one of the big five, and they take that seriously. So they really measure everything that they do as far as their development initiatives. So that's, that's one. And then the second is there's got to be sustainable practices that keep things front and center in people's minds, right? So um, how do you tie your curriculum together? How do you make sure that the, the, the work they're doing in the real world matches what you're training in the training? That those are the things that are going to make it stick and make it impactful. Oh, the other one is they involve their managers of the people going through the training. So one of my clients, we kick off this five, it's a two and a half week program with five virtual sessions spread over these two and a half weeks with field work in between. But we kick it off where not just the attendee who's gonna be attending it, but also their manager come to a kickoff session mm -hmm. where we talk about what they're gonna be learning and experiencing and then what's the manager's responsibility to help with the learning? So that's another big piece that is missing in 90% of training programs out there. So you think about measurement, you think about spreading it out, think about the work application, the practice of those things in the session of, with real life situations, not just can. So most of our programs, we start, you know, you start with a practicing with a can scenario, but then you move into that's a preparation for real life conversations you need to have with the people that you're leading. You know, those things just aren't done by most organizations. 
it's a commitment that that's, takes resources and money. Yeah, I I imagine the one that I had in mind too. I mean, I love the ones you mentioned, and they seem to be consistent with what we believe. I don't know that we've come close to perfecting them or mastering them, but important tenets to what we do. Another one, though, that I think a major shift is just the agility, if that's the right word, of the the learning design. You know, the leadership development efforts that they're, they're agile. You're not. We're not investing millions of dollars, or even maybe sometimes thousands. It, it's all relative, but we're not investing a lot in video production or you know major packaging of the training anymore. Not necessary, right? Uh, it needs to be agile. What we're creating this month may be obsolete next month. And the platform, the, the process needs to accommodate that. I mean, is that a real thing or not? Yes, and it's something that we are pushing on right now. So when I, uh, we had this program that I was doing for this one client, and we had an old leading virtually program that was kind of sometimes used but wasn't used with a lot of clients so when all this hit our normal product development process is six months from concept to you know through testing and creating materials and everything else it took us 30 days to create and roll out this new leading virtually program mm. and we'd never tried that before we'd never tried that before and what i'm really excited by is i've got this client that i'm working with who wanted to make some changes to this program. They wanted to bring in some cultural pieces and, and do some other things more experientially. And they allowed me, this was so much fun. I had three cohorts going over three weeks back to back. So I had three different groups of 15 or so people going through this and they let me experiment. So I tried out some things with the first group and I told the group I was gonna be doing this. And then I made some adjustments and tried out some of those with the second group and then with the third group. And now I've got this finished product that is so much better mm -hmm. than if I would have just tried to create it in a laboratory and, you know, done some beta testing and stuff like that. And it took me six months to create. This is much better than anything I could have done before that. That's great. That's awesome. All right, John, one last question for you. Okay. okay. Put you on the spot again. Uh oh. Um, if we were asking, if we were sitting here with Ken Blanchard or with your team members, you know, the people that work with John Hester the most, all right, and we asked them three words that describe John's leadership style, his approach, what, what adjectives would they, mm -hmm. would they use to describe John Hester? I would hope but I, I think and I hope that caring would be the first one they'd come up with. Caring. Um, the second one that is really, I think, an interesting mix of that is responsive. So I, I tend to be very responsive to text, emails, requests, etc. cetera. Um, and I would say the third one is probably um, agile is not the word I'm looking for, but I, I have a lot of diverse things that I bring that I can do. So I don't just do one thing. And I think that, that level of flexibility and yeah, something like that, but it's, you know, bring a lot of, uh, tools to the table kind of thing. Yeah. Excellent. Good. You're a baseball fan. Huge. Dodgers. Huge. <laughs> this is killing me. Looking forward to going back to a game one of these days. Uh, I don't care if I go to one. I just want to see one. See one, yeah. I'm not a big enough fan, though, that I can watch Korean baseball. It's just like I've got to, I've got to care about who wins, and I don't think I can get behind a Korean baseball team. But uh, yeah. So that's that's going on right now, then? You can oh, yeah, you know that? that there are no, a lot of baseball no. fans that are watching Korean baseball on ESPN. Might have yeah. to check into that, see how that goes. But All right. Well, John, thank you very much. We'll have to do this again. I appreciate your time and the insight I loved it. put into so. this. And so thank you very much. This will be 
uh, recorded. It'll be the recording of this will be on our website as well at uh, learningpointonline.com. And if you wanted to get in touch with John, just reach out to us and we, I'm sure we can connect you. So John, Great. have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time, okay? Thanks, Mark. Appreciate right, it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.